Okay, so there's one more dimension of these two things. The first being receiving from God, just like Christ received on the cross, and just as he received prior. That's the God deed, and that's the only thing that is counted as a good deed at you know God's juridical standard. The flip side being good deeds, which is Satan's plan. Satan's call, Satan's idea of what righteousness is. And it results in phenomenal incompetence. I mean, he's the most brilliant creature God ever made, and yet he's the stupidest. Whether you think God is righteous or not, after all this time, can't you tell that your own ideas don't work? I mean, we all can tell Satan's not happy. What is he getting for his position? A fantasy that, oh, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, doesn't matter how much evidence is against me. <laughs> that's, that's goofy. You know, like the dog in the Disney cartoon. I'm right, I'm right. <laughs> Except he's not goofy. That's the worst part about it. He's justifying himself with all this, these defense mechanisms, rationalization, compensation, denial, sublimation, and especially projection. The latter being when you take, you got a flaw that you subliminally recognize in yourself and you throw it on to somebody else and you, you fantasize that you got rid of your own flaw that way. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't, no, you know, 2,000 years he's been trying to get perfect environment to be Christ to the punch and it ain't working. You can't throw money at the poor. You can't educate a person who doesn't want to learn. Those are the twin problems basic to society. The reason we have so much divergence between the top and the bottom is fundamentally because people don't want to learn. And throwing money at people who don't want to learn just means that they're going to waste the money. And, and they'll be just as poor as before you gave them money. So, hard knocks in life help us to desire to learn, if only to get better things than we got now. But all those hard knocks should have taught Satan, and he's not learning anything. He can speak all the languages there are, he knows math better than anybody, he knows the Bible better than everybody put together, and yet he doesn't know it at all. Because he flunked the process of 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. It's a growth process. That's why Paul likens it at the end of 1 Corinthians 13 to faith, hope, love. First you gotta have the faith. Well, faith first means the content. Well, Satan's got that. But it's not simply having the content. You can memorize the whole Bible. That doesn't mean nothing. That's what Paul's saying in, you know, 1 Corinthians 1, you know, 13, 1 through 3. Yeah, if I have all the content, but I don't have what? The thinking of Christ. Well, I'm thinking of Christ is the Bible, but it's an actual thinking. Not just memorization. So, you got the faith. That's a start. That's a childhood thing. Everybody memorizes stuff in childhood. You know, I know my ABCs. Yeah, but you don't know what that means. You just can spout it. Whoopee. That's first stage, though. You got to also believe in it. Well, how can you believe in something you don't understand? You can memorize, okay, you got the content in your head, spout it off. Okay, but you can't believe in what you don't understand. So now you have to spend time actually learning what's inside your head. You know, all the angels, you know, God created them all in one fell swoop. Satan being the top of the tree. They had all these libraries of knowledge in their head, part of and parcel of being created. Bing. 
Okay, well, what do you do with it? Tomorrow you inherit $30 million. Okay, now you got the money. Okay, how do you use it? Well, if you don't know anything about money, you don't know how to use it. And you'll screw it up. Okay, so you got, you got faith, the content, faith. Well, I want to I wanna understand it. That's the beginning of belief in. So you start trying to understand it, and that's constant test of wanting to believe in. Because, it, you know, you have to go through some effort to try to understand a thing. Everything we do is based on some kind of believing in. You get up in the morning because you believe you ought to do that. You brush your teeth because you believe you ought to do that. You learn to brush your teeth because you believe you ought to learn. See, everything's based on belief. But it starts with a content that's presented to you, and then it's like, yes, no. Yes, I want to learn this. Yes, I want to do this. No, I don't want to learn this. No, I don't want to do this. That's all faith. It's a, it's a passive thing presented to you, receiving. And then the active part is, okay, now what do I do? What do I want with this thing that's presented to me? Yes, no. Yes, I want to learn. Yes, I want to understand. No, I don't want to learn. No, I don't want to understand. And there's a certain, it's all voting, really. Voting means you believe in something. So you're voting to learn to brush your teeth. You're voting to learn the Bible. You've already got some of it in your head because you heard it so much. Okay, do you understand it? And only after you start to understand it can you really believe in it. So you've got all those little votes that are faith. That's at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, love. Okay, hope is a special Greek word, el piso. That's a con that means confident expectation, specifically about the future. It was culturally defined um, by Plato using Socrates and the Phy Philebus where he fleshes out the meaning of this confidence. And it specifically has to do with confidence in the gods. Of course, there's really only one god, but, you know, you, you can adjust it for the actual identity of God. Confidence in the gods. You can't see yet the justice, but you have confidence in the future with respect to the gods. Okay? And that's a specific use that's related to faith because pistas means faithful, pistis, which we translate as faith, means the content that's deposited in the temple, contract, it's a commercial term, by the one who's faithful. And he puts it in the temple because he's basically saying, if I put it in the temple, I'm swearing that I'm going to fulfill this thing and may the gods destroy me. If I don't. So now you, the recipient of this contract, have pissed this faith in the content of the contract by the pistas, the faithful person depositing it. So el piso, which is hope, is confidence in the future based on the pistas, the faithful gods, depositing their promises in the temple, in which you have pistis, faith. So you see, faith and hope are playing off each other constantly. The more you learn a language, the more you learn words, the more you learn how to brush your teeth, the more confidence you have in the act of brushing your teeth and in the results of brushing your teeth. It's a gradual thing that increases. The baby takes its first steps. It's very hesitant at that time. But as it takes more steps because it keeps believing in the idea of trying to take steps, it develops more confidence in walking. See? This is everything in your life is based on 
something presented to you that you believe in or you don't. As a result of believing in it, you try to learn it or practice it. And as a result of that, you get confidence in the future, in doing it again. Okay? So faith, hope, and then what happens after that? Love. You come to love what you know. And that's the rub. What is it that you know? Do you know God? Or do you know good? And if you know good, it's no good. Good apart from God is no good. That's Romans 4. So if what you know is apart from God and it becomes no good, everything you do becomes incompetent. Good apart from God has the extra O for opposition. Satan's the guy who invented good. Now the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so he's no good. He's incompetent. How can he look at God all this time and be so damn dumb? So those are your two stark choices. God or good. God, which is true good, or good, which is no good. And which do you want to know? You're going to believe in one or the other at any moment in time. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. Just like everybody else in the human race and Satan included, I'm always getting this, be good, be good, be good, be good, beeping. That's the essence of the old sin nature. Be good, be good, be good. This is our one number one proof that the Bible really happened the way it says in Genesis 3, specifically. Satan says to the woman, eat this fruit and you'll be good. Was she dumb or what? She takes it. Who's dumber? Her or Adam for choosing her over God? So those are the two trends in the human race. Be good. Be good. Be good. Be good. Do this magical thing and you'll be good. Uh Uh-huh. Can you be dumber? And then choose between God and people. That's Adam. That, that was Adam's fall. We're all doing that all the time. I am constantly choosing something or some person in the name of helping people over God. Why? Be good. Be good. Why do I have to be good? I mean, come on. Think about that. I got a cup that's my favorite cup. I got a plant that's my favorite plant. What? It's a cup. There's no good or bad about it. It's a cup. I happen to like that cup. I will call it good, but is the cup actually good? No. In my case, the cup I told you about that I like so much had a huge crack in it from top to bottom. And why the coffee didn't leak out, I don't know. The crack over time became very, very dark brown from the coffee. But the coffee never leaked out of it. Okay, the cup did not of itself create that happy result. The cup was cracked. The cup didn't, oh, I'm holding the coffee in. The cup had no ability to do that. You can't call a cup good. And my croton, my croton had thousands of gnat eggs in it. So it was infected. You can't call that good either. Okay, but I loved it. I even made pets out of some of the gnats. I taught them things. Because I felt like it. Because I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that cup. Neither one of those things were good. Didn't matter to me. You see the point? I don't need to be good for God. 
I don't have to tie myself up in knots like Satan's doing. When God made me, he could have made me any way he wanted. And if it was an issue to him to make me good by whatever definition he wants to call, then he could have done that. He can do it right now. He can just, peek, brain out's now perfect. And there's going to come a day when he does do that. He's going to do it to you, and he's going to do it to me, and he's going to do it to everybody who believes in Christ. Okay, but he's not doing it now. He could have spared Christ on the cross by having fewer humans. Since 90%, 99% of the human race is going to hell. That just drives me crazy every day. I just want to scream. He didn't have to make them in the first place. So then there would have been fewer sins for Christ to pay for on the cross. Why do you do that? See, we don't have to be good. That's the whole point God's making to Satan. Hi, Satan. Yeah, I created you perfect. But I didn't create you perfect for your performance. The less you sin, the more fellowship we can have. The less you sin, the more the relationship will be pleasant for you. Even when it's not pleasant. And Christ went all the way to the cross and he didn't sin. And Hebrews 12 2 calls that happiness. Happiness. Okay, so it doesn't have to feel good to be good. It doesn't have, I don't have to be good to be happy. See, Satan's completely incompetent in his thinking. And so are we. You, you have to be good. See, we, we're going after being good because we think that if we're good, we'll then be happy. Okay, you're better today at some things than you were yesterday. Or ten years ago. Did it make you happier? Not really. Because there are other things you're not good at. And they always interfere with the things you are good at. There's somebody in your periphery who's not good at something. That interferes with whatever they're good at. There's always a glitch. I know sooner get one computer working right in Windows than another one goes wrong. See, I need everything to be good and because in my mind I'm saying I need it to be good in order to be happy. I need it to be good in order to get the work done. And there's a limited, very limited corridor of truth to that. But God's saying, hey, wait a minute. Let me take you on this journey. I don't need you to be good for me. That's not why I made you. I didn't make you to do pet tricks. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And you learn and live on Bible. And he takes you through the paces. Because you're in a training program. And you start to learn. A happiness with God. That's completely independent. Of how good you are. Of how good anybody else is. So you start not to need things to be good. In order to be happy. See those are the twin lies. That Satan's believing. And we're believing. I need to be good to be happy. No you don't. The cross is called a happiness in Hebrews 12 too. It's sort of, you know, bad translation to say, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. No, it's to his exhibited happiness he endured the cross. He was happy to be there. He even told the disciples that. Oh, I'm so glad this last Passover has finally come. I long to share this meal with you. Now I'm going to die on the cross. When you really love 
something. You want to go to trouble to get it. You want to pour yourself out for it. What about all those women who collect dolls? Never understood that. You know, Glass Menagerie, played by Tennessee Williams. You collect this doll and that doll, and you go to all this trouble to, you know, dust them every day, and you hold them, and you look at it, and I'm like, well, they're just little glass figurines. Yeah, but see, the person loves those glass figurines. Christ loved paying for sins on the cross. Huh? Hey, teach his own. Okay, but this is God's own. This is God's taste, if you will. And he wants the intimacy. He wants to show us why I don't have to be good. God's going to give me the goodness. Hi, this is what the cross is for. You want to be good? Okay, fine. You're already good. Righteousness of God in him. Okay. Done. Finish. Okay, now do you want to understand why it's okay to be what you are? Why it doesn't matter to me? You don't have to be good. You don't have to be superior. You don't have to be equal. You can just be you. Yeah, well, how many of us would say, Oh, yeah, I'd like to learn that, God, because I'm feeling really stupid all the time. But Satan's saying, No, I can be good on my own. Yeah, see, because he had this title before he fell. Isaiah fourteen twelve. He was a bright morning star. The guy who started the day. In charge of the day. In charge of the throne. Walking amidst the stones of fire. Nickname for the angels. He was the guy everybody looked at. He was a celebrity. It's real tough to give that up. Christ gave it up. Philippians 2, 5 through 10. And now here's the real kicker of the deal. Satan had the title of Morning Star, Hillel ben Shachar, in the Hebrew. Son of the Morning. That's another, you know, it's dual entendre. The planet Venus represented that. What we call Venus. Everybody knew about that in the human race. A lot of stories about that. Okay, the the idea of Apollo in Greek myths came from this. He was the guy who started the day, son of the morning, before he fell. He fell because that wasn't enough for him. He fell because although he was better than everybody else, he was nothing compared to God. And that dichotomy just was too much. God's busy saying to him, God this case, God the son. Look, you don't have to be on my level. You're superior to them. I'm trying to show you by giving you this office of being superior to them. The joy of parenting. So he could dish it out. But receiving? Oh, that was a whole other story. See the problem? But I can't give to you. Okay. God talks back to Satan when he says that. You don't have to. I'm giving to you. I enjoy that. Why can't we have that relationship? Don't you think the creatures below you, the angels below you, are enjoying the fact that you're superior to them? They're enjoying it. They don't have to be equal to you. They're enjoying your superiority. You're pouring yourself into them. Same story that would later happen with Adam and the animals. 
There is a joy that you get by being inferior and getting from the superior. There is another joy that the superior gets to pouring himself for the inferior. So God was trying to teach Satan, Hi, you're superior to them, you like that. And he really did. So now enjoy their side of it. You're inferior to me. So? He couldn't get that. He just couldn't. So God has to do something kind of drastic. And that's what we'll pick up in the next increment.